morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are, and welcome to Global Atheist News, our weekly report on how religion has impacted humanity over the last seven days. Dateline, 3rd of December, 2022. This week's headlines. Russia hits out as the Pope labels the minority ethnic soldiers cruel. Students are killed as a bomb blast hits an Afghan school. The Taliban ban women from entering Kabul's gyms, parks and fun fairs. The US knew for weeks that the Islamic State leader was dead. One love armbands are divisive, says Qatari chief. An LGBTQ protester invades the pitch during Portugal versus Uruguay. A YouTuber is arrested for being atheist in Egypt. The Vatican says its website has been hacked again. China vows a more friendly consensus amid Vatican complaints. Trump dines with virulent anti-Semites Nick Fuentes and Kanye West. Johnny Hunt, former SBC president accused of abuse, can return to the ministry. The UK 2021 census results are out. In an interview with a Jesuit magazine called America, Pope Francis was asked about his apparent reluctance to directly condemn Russia for the war in Ukraine. In response, he said he received much information about the cruelty of the troops. Generally, the cruelists are perhaps those who are not of the Russian tradition such as the Chechens, the Buryats, and so on, he said. He added, the one who invades is the Russian state. In an apparent response to accusations of not directly condemning President Putin, the Pope said, sometimes I try not to specify so as not to offend, and I condemn in general, although it is well known whom I am condemning. It is not necessary that I put a name and surname. Later in the interview, the, the Pope added, everyone knows my stance with Putin or without Putin without naming him. Russia called the remarks a perversion and said national groups were one family. At least 17 people have been killed and 26 injured after a bomb blast hit a religious school in northern Afghanistan. The blast took place in the city of Abak in Samangan province, reportedly as people were leaving prayers. The majority of those killed are believed to be children aged 9 to 15, a source said. A doctor at the local hospital said, most of the victims were students at the school. All of them are children and ordinary people, he was quoted as saying. He added that some patients with critical injuries were transported to larger hospitals in Mazar-e-Sharif, about 74 miles away, for better treatment. Interior Ministry spokesman Abdul Nafi Takur said, the Taliban's security forces were investigating the attack, and he vowed to identify the perpetrators and punish them for their actions. Taliban leaders later blamed ISIS-K for the attack, although the group itself did not take responsibility. Since the Taliban regained power in August 2021, the rights of women and girls have become increasingly restricted. Girls have been blocked from entering secondary schools. Women have been banned from most fields of employment 
and are not able to travel long distances without a male escort. It is also mandatory to wear the hijab or the burqa when outside of the home. The most recent measure, excluding women from parks, gyms and fairgrounds, comes just months after the Taliban ordered these spaces to be segregated by gender. Women were allowed to visit parks on three days a week, Monday, Sunday and Tuesday, while men had access on the remaining four days. But even this has now been taken away with the spokesman from the Vice and Virtue Ministry saying people were not observing the segregation rules and women were not wearing the hijab. Mohammed Akif Mahaja said, we have seen both women and men together in the parks and unfortunately the hijab was not being observed. So we had to come up with another decision. And for now, we ordered all parks and gyms to be closed to women. Word from the Islamic State terror group that it had lost its second leader in less than a year came as no surprise to the United States, which had been aware of his demise for more than a month. IS, also known as ISIS or Daesh, announced the death of Abu al-Hassan al-Hashimi al-Qurashi in a short audio statement on Wednesday with spokesman Abu Umar al-Mahajir saying, he died fighting the enemies of God, killing some of them before being killed like a man on the battlefield. US Central Command later issued its own statement confirming Abu al-Hassan was killed in mid-October in Syria's southern Daraa province by the Free Syrian Army, a rebel group that does not partner with the US. European nations wanting to wear One Love captain's armbands are sending out a divisive message, says Qatar World Cup chief Hassan al-Thawadi. England and Wales were among seven countries to abandon plans to wear them during matches because players faced disciplinary action if they did so. Al-Thawadi says it was not his decision to sanction sides for wearing it. It's a FIFA decision. I wasn't part of that discussion. The governing bodies England, Wales, ben Belgium, Denmark, Germany, the Netherlands and Switzerland said they had written to FIFA in September informing them about the One Love armband but had not received a response. However, Germany players covered their mouths during the team photograph before the World Cup opener against Japan to convey the message that FIFA is silencing the teams. See this video. A protester carrying a rainbow flag invaded the pitch during the World Cup game between Portugal and Uruguay. Mario Ferri wore a t-shirt with Save Ukraine on the front and Respect for Iranian women on the back. Stewards chased him and he dropped the flag before being taken off the field at Lucille Stadium. Italian activist Ferry was released by authorities after a brief detention, said the Italian Foreign Ministry. Qatar's Supreme Committee confirmed that he was released shortly after being removed from the pitch and that his embassy had been informed. It added that his higher card, an entry permit to Qatar for World Cup attendees, had been cancelled and he has been banned from attending future matches at this tournament. 
the decision to stage the World Cup in Qatar, where homosexuality is illegal, has been criticized by LGBTQ plus groups. See this video. I found it difficult to get, you know, should I boycott it, should I enjoy it, it's the World Cup and that's what we all look forward to, it brings us all together. But then, you know, I'll be turning our back on huge issues that happen in that country and others around the world as well. It is heartbreaking as a football fan. I can't in good conscience engage with it. So I might check on like the sports news to see what the scores are, but I don't think I'm going to watch any games. I don't think I'm going to go to like the pub with my mates to watch the games like I have done with previous World Cups, like I did with the Women's Euros this year. I feel quite conflicted as a you know, gay woman, um, you know, in the LGBTQ plus community. However, you know, I am Welsh as well. So as you can tell by my hat, um, it's the first time we've qualified for the World Cup in 64 years. So, you know, as much as there's a lot of reasons to kind of hate Qatar and potentially bow out of the World Cup, watching the World Cup or engaging with the World Cup, this might be a once in a lifetime opportunity. You know, we want to respect other countries' beliefs and cultures and stuff, but it's difficult to respect a country where they persecute people like me. So it's a tough one. Do we, are we allowed to enjoy it? Should we feel guilty about enjoying the World Cup? Do we boycott it? There's lots of different opinions going around and lots of my friends are saying different things. I'm sort of torn as well. Without talking about stuff, um, change won't happen. Um, and I think if anything good can come from this World Cup, it, it's shining the light on Qatar and hopefully um, a nation like Qatar won't host the World Cup again. I think it's a bit rich to criticise Qatar to the degree we potentially have been. Yeah, it's not great. Yeah, they need to change. Um, but we need to look at our own our own country first and the legacy we've left. Um, this is a problem globally. I think in talking about it now, it's more about compensating where we can and also moving forward um, to preventing these kinds of situations happening in future tournaments. But I also think in talking about it, it's important to not use this conversation to also kind of deflect away from where these issues are happening elsewhere and the fact that it's this, this situation is not unique to Qatar nor is it new uh, it's kind of a problem that's been building in football for a long time I do think sport has the football in particular has the ability to bring people together and bring communities together so I almost feel like boycotting watching the World Cup would be cutting our noses off to spite our face an Egyptian YouTuber named Hesham had a religious discourse with a sheikh from Al Azhar on his show. Ahmed Karima cursed Hesham, who then withdrew from the discussion. The sheikh then took advantage of his connections to press the national security personnel to apprehend Hesham and the owner of the channel. On Sunday, November the 6th, the Sheik came live on a channel in, and incited against Hesham again and called on lawyers to press charges to the public prosecutor against the channel and its guests on charges of disrespecting Islam with the aim of blocking the channel in Egypt. On the same day, Hesham came out on a live video on YouTube in which he talked about the threats directed at him and said that he will stop for a period of time until the threat has passed. A Vatican spokesman said on Wednesday that the Holy See has taken down its main Vatican.va website amid an apparent attempt to hack the site. Technical investigations are ongoing due to abnormal attempts to access the site, Vatican spokesman Matteo Brunei said. Attempts to access the Vatican VA website from several different web browsers produced 404 error messages. Ancillary websites such as press.vatican.va were still online as of Wednesday. The Vatican issued an unusually harsh statement on Saturday, complaining that on November the 24th, Beijing had installed Bishop John Peng Weizio as an auxiliary bishop in the province of Jinzai, 
which the Vatican doesn't recognize as a diocese. Asia News, which follows the Catholic Church closely in China, said Pope Francis had ordained Peng clandestinely as Bishop of Yujiang in 2014, four years before the 2018 Accord, explaining that the Holy See's lament that he had been named by Beijing to another diocese that it doesn't recognize. Listen to this audio. Beijing and the Vatican are once again tangling over the prickly issue of appointing Chinese bishops. After complaints from the Vatican that Beijing was violating a 2018 interim accord, China's foreign ministry spokesperson Zhao Lijian on Monday said the country is willing to expand the friendly consensus achieved with the Vatican over bishop nominations. The Vatican issued an unusually harsh statement Saturday, complaining that Beijing on November 24 had installed Bishop John Peng Weizhou as an auxiliary bishop in the province of Jiangxi, which the Vatican doesn't recognize as a diocese. China and the Vatican haven't had diplomatic relations since 1951, following the communists' rise to power and the expulsion of foreign priests. The Vatican has sought in recent years to open contacts and reduce frictions, particularly over the appointment of bishops. At a daily briefing Monday, Zhao said he was unaware of the specific situation involving Bishop Peng, but said that relations between China and the Vatican had improved over recent years for the benefit and harmonious development of Chinese Catholicism. Former President Donald Trump drew intense criticism after having dinner at his Mar-a-Lago resort with two notorious anti-Semites, Kanye West, also known as Ye, and his pal, Holocaust denier Nick Fuentes. A person familiar with the dinner said Trump was very impressed with Nick Fuentes, who was a leader of the 2017 Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, where a white nationalist killed an anti-racism protester and who frequently expresses grave concerns about the U.S. population is becoming less white. Disgraced former Southern Baptist Convention President Johnny Hunt plans a return to ministry after completing a restoration process overseen by four pastors, according to a video released last week. Hunt, a long-time megachurch pastor in Georgia, was named earlier this year in the Guidepost Solutions report on sexual abuse in the SBC, which alleged that Hunt had sexually assaulted another pastor's wife in 2010. Guidepost, the third-party investigation firm, found the claims credible. We believe the greatest days of ministry for Johnny Hunt are the days ahead, said Reverend Stephen Kyle, pastor of Hilland Park Baptist Church in Panama City, Florida, in the video. Kyle, along with other pastors, said they had worked with Hunt and his wife on an intentional and an intense season of transparency, reflection, and restoration in recent months. In that process, Kyle said he and other pastors had observed Hunt's genuine brokenness and humility before God and deemed him fit for ministry in the future. See this video. Hi, I'm Pastor Stephen Kyle, and I'm here with pastors Benny Tate, Mark Hoover, and Mike Whitson. It has been our humble responsibility over the last several months to work directly and closely with Johnny Hunt and his family as they chose to enter into an intentional and an intense season of transparency, reflection, and restoration. Pastor Johnny considered submitting himself to a similar process, which he founded at Woodstock many years ago. But when he sought our counsel, we advised him and his family that we thought it was wise for this process to take place away from Woodstock in order to give the hunts the space and the privacy they uniquely needed during this season, which is the same process Pastor Johnny used 
in restoring over 400 men to ministry. We were in agreement with the leadership of First Baptist Church of Woodstock that the Hunt's membership should be in the church of their restoration. And they also agreed to submit entirely to the process that we put in place. It has been to us a sacred duty and a serious one. But I want to be very clear today. Pastor Johnny has been accountable to us and has chosen to remain accountable to us going forward. In fact, I've spoken to Pastor Johnny nearly every day since all of this came to light. Most days I've spoken to him several times a day. Pastor Johnny has spent hours speaking to individual members of this spiritual care team, and we've all met together on multiple occasions, traveling from our individual parts of the country to do so. We've also worked hard to provide the family with all the support they've needed during this time. Over the course of the last several months, Johnny and Janet have submitted themselves to a series of intense private counseling sessions together. Alongside that, Pastor Johnny engaged separately in an on-site intensive counseling program as well. This is all in addition to the 16 weeks of private counseling the Hunts participated in 12 years ago when the original incident occurred. You know, we've spent many months with Pastor Johnny. We've also observed his genuine brokenness and humility before God. We look forward to the days ahead to see how God continually leads in Johnny's life and to be there to offer our continued support. Figures from the 2021 census released on Tuesday by the Office for National Statistics revealed that fewer than half the people in England and Wales consider themselves Christian. Some 46.2% of the population of England and Wales describe themselves as Christian on the day of the 2021 census, down from 59.3% a decade earlier. The Muslim population grew from 4.9% to 6.5%, while 1.7% identified as Hindu, up from 1.5%. More than one in three people, 37%, said they had no religion, up from 25% in 2011. Secularist campaigners said the shift should trigger a rethink of the way religion is entrenched in British society. Andrew Copson, Chief Executive of the charity Humanists UK, said, One of the most striking things about these results is how at odds the population is from the state itself, he said. No state in Europe has such a religious setup as we do in terms of law and public policy, while at the same time having such a non-religious population. Archbishop of York Stephen Cottrell one of the most senior clerics in the Church of England, said the data was not a great surprise, but it was a challenge to Christians to work harder to promote their faith. This week's Free Thought Hour, the show that follows this news, features two of our favourite guests, David Orenstein and Scott Weigold. I'm hoping to get their thoughts on proof, truth and belief. You can join in by texting your comments and questions. It's live and it's free. And don't forget to watch Global Atheist News Review, our spin-off show where a panel of opinionated people get a chance to express their views on this very news. The GAN team will be back with our weekly news report next week. And please like, share, subscribe comment and set the notifications. This has been Global Atheist News. Thank you for watching.